Welcome to this third part of this two lecture introduction to computer networking. And today we're going to look at some TCP IP protocols. First we're going to repeat this model, the Open Systems Interconnection Reference Model that we talked about in the last lecture, where we have computer networking divided into layers, each one specifically designed to provide some function. So we have the application layer that provides a way for the application to interact with the network. And then we have the presentation layer that provides context for the application layer protocol. Then we have the session layer that is meant to establish sessions between computers or applications rather maybe. Uh, transport that has to do with managing how the information is transferred over the network. We have the network layer that provides network to network communication. We have the data link layer that provides local link or local area communication. And the data link layer also controls the physical layer where we find the cables or the air or whatever we use to transfer the information. And today we are going to work with this example. I am asking my application to get me a web page at this URL. So I interact with my application and my application then interacts with the network and we're going to take a look at how this works by looking at the different information used in the different layers. And we start at the application layer. So now my application creates an HTTP GET request. And it looks something like this. We have a line that specifies what we want to get. And then my application identifies itself. It says what it is willing to accept. And then it tells which host it's, it is looking for. Tests, TH, ISON, and so on. And this is basically the application layer header. This is the first piece of information that my computer is going to send to the other computer. And this instructs the other side's application and tells it what to do. It tells the other side's application, in this case, what I want. Which page on this web server I want access to. And when this, uh, this piece of information is packed and ready, we go down to the transport layer. And the transport layer creates a connection. This is actually done before HTTP kicks in, or my application or HTTP says, OK, I need a connection here. And this is needed to be able to construct this message. We need to establish an application, an, an, a connection in TCP, and we will look at that shortly. And here we see the, I, I'd say, most important information in the TCP header. We see a source port. The source port, that is the way for the responding server to reach my application. So my application is now actively listening at TCP port 44712. And anything that arrives at that port is part of this communication or is interpreted as part of this communication. And then we have the destination port, the port on the server we are trying to reach, and that is port 80. And then we have the stuff that makes this connection connection oriented and reliable. We have a sequence number and we have an acknowledgement number. And the sequence number tells the server where, how much data I have sent. How much data I've transferred to the server. Now, we've just established the connection here, so the sequence number is one. And then we have the acknowledgement number. That's also one. And that is the instruction instructing the other server what data I have received. And since we've just established this connection, we haven't actually received any data. 
So we tell the other server, OK, I'm ready for your first byte. And then we see the length of this message, 175 bytes. And that means that the next sequence number will be higher. It will add these 175. So the next sequence number will be 176 or something like that. And then we have the flags. And we will look at flags a little bit in the later slide. This only has the acknowledgment flag. This is the most common flag. It just says, OK, I've received. I'm ready to, to get this data that is in the acknowledgment field. And this header is also added to the message. So now we have the HTTP header and we have the TCP header. And from here we move down, we move on via the first detour. Because if you paid attention, we actually skipped a few layers. We, we skipped the session layer and we skipped the presentation layer. And this is the difference between at the one hand the OSI model and at the other hand TCP IP. Because these two evolved in parallel. Work on TCP IP had already begun and it was active development. And then these standardizing organizations sat down and invited a lot of people and they started to standardize this model. And they evolved in separate, separate lines. Pretty close to one another. And if, uh, if we look at TCP IP, we will find an application, we will find a transport layer, we will find a network layer that is most often called the internet layer, we will find a data link layer or link layer, and we might find a physical layer or it might be baked into the data link or link layer. And TCP IP protocols are most often found in the three top layers here. And so when you look at TCP IP protocols, most often you will find their functions above the network layer, you will find maybe transport and session layer fun functions in the transport layer and maybe presentation layer, application layer information in the application. But this TCP IP, it's not a prescribing model. It's a model that's grown out of, of the early development here. OSI is prescribing, it tells you how to do. This is more a way of explaining the reality as it looks. And since every model is a simplification, it's not sure that it works in, <coughs> in every case. And still we keep on teaching the OSI model. And then we have another thing that we could discuss here, staying at the transport layer. And that, this is the TCP three-way handshake. I said that we need to establish this communication even before, before uh, the HTTP, HTTP message was sent. And this is how this is done. And since I am the one initiating this communication, my application starts, or my computer starts its communication by sending a TCP message containing my source port, the destination port, a sequence number, no a length field, uh, there are even more fields, but these are the important fields. A length, length field and a flag, and the flag is a sin for synchronization. So my application is, is actually asking the server at the other end, please, can we establish a connection here? And the sequence number here is zero, zero, but it's a random number. So the actual message had a different number. But for simplification, it's set to zero here. And then if the server wants to communicate with me, if there is some application actively listening at, at this port, port 80 on the receiving side, and if it is willing to communicate with me, it will send a message back. And in this case, yes, it wants to communicate with me. Its own source port, my port as the destination, since that is where my application is listening for this communication. Sequence number zero, this is also a random number, a different random number from mine. And it says, I acknowledge I am ready to receive the first byte. 
and it has two flags, synchronization and acknowledgement. Acknowledgement, since it is acknowledging that it's received something or it's ready to receive something, and synchronization because it's the response to my first message. And then I send a response to this that just says, OK, I am now at sequence one. I am acknowledgement, uh, acknowledging that I am ready to receive your first byte. And then we start the communication. So these three messages are exchanged before my application can make the request from the web server. Then we move down to the network layer or the internet layer in TCP IP. And this is where we send our data from one network to another. And the protocol here is IP. It's the only protocol we will use here when we use TCP IP. And here is some of the information from the IP header. First we have the version, and in this case we, I used version 4. Where version 6 is up and coming, and it's been for some 15 years now. And I think it's finally starting to take off. Then we have a time to live field, in this case 64, and it specifies how long this IP message is alive, uh, allowed to live in the network before it should be discarded. And this number is reduced with one at each computer between mine and the end uh, receiving system. So each router, as they are called when they are moving messages from one network to another, each router or gateway reduces this number by one, and if any router reduces this to zero, it will discard this message and send a message back to me saying that time to live expired. So if my message gets caught in a loop, at some point one of the gateways handling this message will make this uh, time to live field zero and then it will discard it and send information back to me. Then we have detail about what protocol is above us so that the receiving computer will be able to send this to the right handler at the transport layer, in this case TCP. Then we have the source IP address of my computer and the destination IP address of the receiving computer. And in IIP version 4, this is a 32-bit 30 30 number. And they are often divided into 8-bit sections, so we'll get four numbers with dots between them. And based on this number, the network is able to deliver the message to the right local network and to the right host in that network. So let's look a bit at that. We have 32 bits in the IPv4 address. Some bits specify the network, and that is, is, that is what's used by the gateways to move this from, one, from my network to the network where the web server is uh, connected. And one part of this address is the host part so that the last gateway that puts this on the last local link will be able to send it to the right destination as well. And if we convert these addresses to bits, uh, they will hopefully look like this. I haven't proof, proofread them very much, but I hope it's something like this. We have the address at the top, and then we have what is called the network mask. And the network mask is what tells you which part is the network part and which part is the host part. And if you've configured the network on your computer or if you've looked at this configuration, you might have seen these two values, address and net mask or network mask or something like that. And the network mask is a string of ones detailing the network part and then zeros for the host part. Host part. And the ones will be from the left, and at the last one you will have only zeros. So you will, you will never see a net mask, network mask, that looks like the first IP address. You will always have a string of ones and then a string of zeros, and no alteration between them. 
and then by a nice Boolean operation you simply get the network by keeping all the ones in the address where there are ones in the net mask and all the zeros kept as well and when you have a zero in the net mask you get a zero in the host part and then you will get the network address so my computer had IP address 192.168.12 and the net mask for that network was 255.255.255.0 255, and that will give me the network address of 192.168.1.0 so that is the network address of my local network and if you want to find out the host we do it the other way around everywhere in the net mask where we have a 1 we put a 0 and everyone, everywhere where we have a zero, we just keep the numbers from the, from the address and then we see that it's number two. That's the host part. But usually when we want to get the host, we look at the complete address. And if we do the same thing with the receiving end, <coughs> I do not know the network mask of that one, so I just took one I thought fun to work with. Uh, then we had 192.158.30.16 and I gave it a net mask 255.255.252.0 and as you see then the network address gets a bit different and the host address actually is meaningless in this case I'd say but it shows you which, which bits are the host bits and that gives you an idea of the size of this network, how big it could be, because any, any bit that is a zero in the network mask could then be a client. So in my network I could have 2 to the power of 8 um, hosts, minus 2 if you want to be careful about it, and in their network with my net mask they would be able to have 2 to the power of 10, so they could connect a lot more computers to their network. So this is what the routers do to figure out where to deliver the message. They compare my address to the known addresses they have in their routing tables and the net masks that these routing table entries have, and then they figure out where to send these messages. When we are talking about IP addresses, there are some special addresses that it might be good to be aware of. They are often detailed in a type of document called a request for comment, and we will come back to them at the end of this lecture. Um, but they might help you if you are trying to figure out some kind of problem. And all these addresses can be found in request for comment 5735. So if you want to find out more about them, please look that uh, document up on the, on the web. We have the 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0 slash 8. And slash 8 tells you how many bits there are in the network mask. So in this case, there is 8 bits you will have a network work mask of 255.0.0.0 and that is called this network so if you want to communicate on the local network where you are these would be the addresses used and this yeah it's it's a fun fun way of of giving you access to a lot of possible hosts 2 to the power of 24 on this network then you have the 10.0.0.0 slash 8 block, and these are called private addresses. Anyone in the world can use them in their internal networks. These should never, ever be sent out onto the internet. They should never be routed on the internet. They should only be used within your organization, within your home. And this makes it possible for you to build a network with 2 to the power of 24 hosts and of course it also reduces the total number of addresses on the internet 
with the same amount. And then you have 127.0.0.0 slash 8, which is loopback addresses, so your computer can talk to itself. So your computer also has 2 to the power of 24 addresses on which it can talk to itself. And if your computer is configured to automatically receive an address from the internet and it, it uh, doesn't find any computer that provides addresses, it might um, self-configure to an address within the 169.254.0.0 slash 16 network. These are local link addresses. So computers on this local network can talk to one another, but these should never be routed outside this local link. They should only be used in this local link. And if gateway is connected to two local links, it might have hosts with the same address on each link. So these should definitely stay local. And then you have another private block, this time with 12 bits in the mask. And then you have a, a reserved block, 192.0.0.0. And then you have 192.0.2.0 slash 24 that can be used for documentation and example code. So if you are writing an, an application that is using the network and you want to put some IP addresses into your documentation, these are addresses at your disposal. And then we have a 6 to 4 relay, so we can communicate between IPv4 and IPv6 networks. Then we have another private block. And then we have some addresses for testing and more for documentation. And then we have a lot of addresses at the end that are reserved. And that is why, no, that is not the only reason, but that's one reason perhaps why we are growing out of IPv4. At the same time, all these private addresses are the reason why we are still using IPv4. Because you can use these addresses internally in your network, and then you can translate them at the border to the internet. Making it possible for several computers, several hundreds of computers, several thousands of computers if you want to, to share the same IP address on the internet. So, if you're an IPv6 nerd and you want the whole world to use IPv6, this is the blessing and the curse that is keeping us in the IPv4 world. That seems to be working quite all right so far. Now when we are done with the IP stuff, we go down to the data link and in this case, Ethernet is used on the link. And here we have a source address, the MAC address of my computer. And we have a destination address, the MAC address of the first gateway, the MAC address of the gateway out of my network. And then, once again, we have information about what protocol this Ethernet frame is encapsulating, what is the next protocol, and of course it specifies IP. So Ethernet tells, when, when, when I use Ethernet, I tell the receiver there is an IP header next. And then when it gets up and looks at the IP header, the IP header says there's a TCP header next. And then TCP only says send it to, send it to this port. And the listener at that port will then hopefully be able to speak HTTP or funny things might happen. And so now the message is constructed and we can send it out onto the internet and it will go through the internet and hopefully end up at this test slash Tyson dot cloud nine dot IO and hopefully I will get this wonderful HGM document HTML document called hello.html. How did you spot the gaps or the magic here? All I said want I want HTTP slash dot slash slash or colon slash slash test dash Tyson dot C9 users dot IO slash hello dot HTML. And somehow all these numbers just 
appeared from nowhere. I never specified any of this explicitly. I only asked my application for that. So where did the rest of this stuff come from? Well, <clears throat> to get the IP address, the address to the other host, I used a, a different protocol. So when I wrote this request, my application actually enabled this other function, this DNS function, and it made a query. And will you talk about, you will talk about DNS later in this course, so I will not go into any detail here. But my computer then sent a message to a DNS server somewhere on the internet. Well, we will see that it was not really on the internet. Um, saying, okay, I want the IP address of test-tyson.c9users.io. It's a type A address and it's on the internet. So it's a host address, an IPv4 host address, and it's an internet address. And then, this time in the transport layer, we find a different protocol, UDP, user datagram protocol. And I get the source port, 9711, and I send it to the destination port, 53. And then we get a new IP header, and the interesting parts here might be the protocol, UDP, which makes sense, and the destination server. This is then the net DNS server on my local network, 192.168.1.1. And then you have the Ethernet addresses of these two computers as well. Sending this message to my gateway, that is also my DNS server, my DNS server in its then connects to the internet to a DNS server, hopefully gets a response, and then this is what my computer gets back. The source and destination addresses are shifted, the source and destination addresses in the IP header are shifted, the source and destination ports in the UDP layer, uh, header are shifted, and then we see the query response, where the three first lines are the same as in my message, and then the address is added. And now my com computer knows the IP address of the computer it is meant to communicate with. So that is how we get the destination address of the, uh, of the, of the for, for my HTTP message. That is the address of the web server. I could specify the IP address in, in the URL, so instead of test-tyson.c9users.io, I could just write 192.158.30.16. The problem is if this web server hosts several domain names or several frequent fully qualified domain names, it might hold test-tyson.c9users.io, test.someoneelse.c9users, example.c9, and, and so on. It won't know which of these I am requesting, and it will go for a default one. So that might cause some interesting troubles if this web server is actually hosting for several domains. But now I have the IP address, so what's next? I need the Ethernet address as well. And then I use the address resolution protocol. And then we see the ARP header here. It specified the hardware type we are working with, Ethernet. It specifies the protocol type in the internet or network layer, which is IP. We tell the, the receiver what kind of message this is. This is a request. We put in the, I, the MAC address of my computer, we put in the IP address of my computer. We put in a blank MAC address, because we do not know that one. That's what we want to figure out. And we put in the IP address that we want to know the MAC address for. So each computer has, each, uh, or I should say, each network interface card has a MAC address. Um, and when you configure an IP address, you sort of connect these two together. 
So your, my computer knows that the network interface with MAC address 606C661ECFD5 is configured with IP address 192.168.1.2. And hopefully, the computer that is configured with the IP address 192.168.1.1 knows which MAC address this IP address is connected to. So I send this one out on the internet, I, on, on the local link, not the internet, on the local link, on my local network. In the Ethernet header, I say that the destination is all ones, and that is the broadcast address for Ethernet. So this one is sent to each host on this local link. Hopefully one of them will have the IP address 192.168.1.1 and it will then respond to me. And lo and behold it did. In the Ethernet frame we find the, des the destination which is my computer, the source, which is the computer we want the MAC address from. And then we get the ARP message back which is pretty much the same message as we sent with the opcode changed to a reply with my MAC address and my IP address set as the target and with the responding computer's IP address, the IP address we want to know as the sender IP and then it adds its own MAC address. And now my computer know which computer on the local network it should communicate with at the Ethernet level. And so here we see how, how we find out the different parts here. I input the URL. From the URL we can deduce the fully qualified domain name. And <clears throat> I specify the protocol and each well-known protocol has a well-known port a default port, so HTTP has the default port 80. And so if I do not specify a port in my URL, the application will then default to 80 because that is the most usual port. From the fully qualified domain name using DNS, we can then figure out the IP address that this HTTP message needs to be sent to in order to be uh, answered and from that IP address via the local routing table so each computer needs to know how to send messages out from its local network and this is usually configured as the gateway address um, and it is the MAC address of that IP address that we are trying to figure out using ARP. So we do not know the MAC address of 192.158.30.16 because that is no, of no importance for us. What's important is the MAC address of the gateway we use to reach this computer. Had, had the IP address been 192.168, um, and I don't remember the rest of my local area network, but dot one, dot five, for example, then we would use the MAC address to reach the final destination as well. But in this case, the local link address is only to get the message out of the local network. And then my gateway will change whatever is in the data link layer and send it off to the next router or gateway all the way until it reaches this computer. And we will never see the MAC address of that computer. So that, that is how the, these in addresses <coughs> are deduced from the URL and how this protocol works together with DNS and ARP as support. So just briefly then, how will the response look? Well, This is the HTTP header that the server sent back to me when I requested this information. It said, it gave me the code 200, which means that here is the page, everything works fine. You might be familiar with 404, for example. 
the, the resource you are requesting is not available, can't find it. We have the date, we have the server type if we, if we are interested in that, and we have the information about when this was last modified, and we get a tag. And these, this information can be useful in a browser when you are caching stuff, for example. If you have a cached copy of the, the resource you are requesting, you might not need to get it again. You can just use the cached version, and then you will get another code, hopefully, that tells you to just use whatever cached version you have. And then, of course, you have specified in your request that you have a, a version of it, and you just want to figure out if you should get the next one. And then you get a bit extra information about what is sent in this message. And then you will have a TCP message using a lot of the information already established, like the ports, the sequence number, the acknowledgement numbers. You will have an IP header with these two addresses changed. So the destination will now be my computer and the source will of course be the web server. And you have the Ethernet frame that specifies the, the addresses on the server's local link, on the server's local network. So in that one you will find the MAC address of the server's gateway, the way the server gets out from its local network. And the difference from the first message that I sent, you also have some data in this one. In this case, the HTML document that I requested. And most often you will find some form of data if you're transferring something, of course. Good. So in this lecture, these are the protocols that I've talked about. The hypertext transfer protocol used to, among other things, let us browse the web. The domain name system protocol, DNS, that lets us, among other things, find out the IP address from a fully qualified domain name. We use TCP that provides connection-oriented reliable communication, so if anything gets lost, both sides both sides have a way to figure this out and they can see what has been received, what's not been received. We saw UDP used for DNS and that is connectionless. So the DNS message I showed you was actually the first message sent in that communication. My computer just assumed that there would be a DNS server on port 53 on 192.168.1.1. And if, they, if there weren't any DNS server there, it would just wait and wait and wait, and then after a specified period of time, it would time out and say it's unable to find this. Had it instead used TCP, it would have found out immediately if there were no DNS server, because there would be no response, or there would be a negative response, a reset or something like that. So that's the difference here between TCP and UDP, both in the, both in the transport uh, layer. Of course, you also realize that TCP, I only showed you part of that header. I only showed you part of the UDP header, but I didn't exclude as much from the UDP header as from the TCP header. TCP creates a lot more overhead. That is what you pay for getting this reliable connection-oriented uh, stuff. You get a lot more overhead. UDP is best effort, it just sends it out on the network and hopes for the best. And TCP actually tries to maintain this connection. And then we looked at Internet Protocol version 4, used to move messages through the internet. And we looked at address resolution protocol to link these IP addresses to the Ethernet addresses. And then we looked at Ethernet that is used for communication within the local area network. Now, I can't stress enough, there are a lot of protocols out there. A lot of protocols. I mean, just look at the other applications popular today, like email, for example, that's a different application layer protocol. And there are tons of them. So what I think you should do if you're really interested in computer networking is that you should start reading requests for comments. 
more or less every protocol you find on the internet is specified in one or more RFCs. And these are technical documents uh, detailing how the protocol should work, what they should and should not do, what they can and cannot do perhaps. And this started as a way to just try to get uh, get feedback on, on those general ideas. There's a whole process around these. They are proposed in, proposed in draft and people discuss them and they are changed and then they are published in a more or less complete way. And sometimes they are very technical, of course, because they are specifying how these protocols should work, so they need to get technical. They are often very informative these are very clever people who are writing those um, RFCs with a lot of knowledge about this. You can learn a lot about networking in general and, and the problem these people see and the, how they try to use them. And some of them are quite funny. I, there are over 7,000 RFCs right now. And some of them are published on April 1st. And they detail protocols that might never be implemented, but that might amuse you if you read them. So, uh, some suggestions for you. RFC 792 is about uh, ICMP that it's used, is used to, to, for example, if the time to live field goes down to zero in a, in a message, an ICP, ICMP message is sent from the router to your computer. So in RFC 792, you will find a specification of this protocol and its different codes. And this is really great for, for understanding errors in the network. You might never see them. If you, if you use the application ping to find out if another host is alive or, or how, how long it takes for you to send a message to that host, you use ICMP. If you use traceroute to see what hops are between you and some compute, you use ICMP. And how it's meant to work is specified in the RFC. RFC 1180 uh, is an introduction to TCP IP. It's, it's from 1991, but I still think it's a good read. If you want to get a better hand on, on internet routing, there is an RFC specifying what's required from a gateway or a router on the internet, which is both informative and, and technical. 2324 is an April Fool's uh, RFC, so if you want nerdy humor, that might be something for you. If you're interested in email, you have one RFC there, and if you want to get deeper into HTTP, which might be a good idea, idea you have the latest RFC specifying HTTP there as well. And of course there is an RFC 1 and there are RFCs after 7230. So there's a wealth of documents on the internet that you can read and get deeper into networking if you want to. That is actually the end of this lecture. And I'm asking the students who are taking this course to please hang on and we will give you some extra information shortly. Thank you. <laughs>